Hi, I'm Matt Ford. I'm a multimedia journalist and an instructor in the upcoming Reporting Change Multimedia Workshop that's going to be based here in Istanbul. And what we're going to do in that workshop is we're going to really fine-tune the narratives in each of the participants' story. We're also going to add some of that post-production polish that really puts a professional edge on a video. So what I'm going to do today with you guys is I'm going to give you a sneak peek in how we're going to do all that. Show you some of the workflows and how to like put that final touch and make your video really sharp. So let's fire up your uh, favorite video editor and get started. One question I tend to get a lot is what editing software is the best? And that's really a question that depends on your personal taste and how you work. But really you can tell a good story with any editing software. Even something like iMovie, you can produce some good stories. Um, so what we're going to focus on in this video is not really the technical specifics of how to use the software, like what button does what. Uh, what we're going to focus on here is workflow and how to approach the different steps of creating your story. One extra little tip is as you're learning your software, uh, really learn the shortcuts because the shortcuts will save you a lot of time um, over the length of your projects and over the length of your career. One program I really like is called Cheat Sheet and uh, basically if you hold down the command button it'll show you all of the shortcuts for whatever program or view that you're looking at. So it's a good way to, if you've forgotten how to use a, different, a certain shortcut, a way to quickly look it up. At the start of every project that I do, the most important thing is to figure out organization. Now, there's no set rule for how to organize your footage, and everybody has an approach that works best for them. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of things that I do to keep myself organized on a project. So at the end of every shoot day, I basically come back and I start offloading all my footage. So you can see here in the project folder that I have on my laptop, um, it's divided into days. And in there, I, I basically break down all my assets. So it's the audio files from my recorder, the audio files from my shotgun mic. But here, it's really easy for me to remember what I did on each shoot day and come back and find these assets. And as my project develops, I've got folders for anything that might come in. Uh, now, once I actually get into the software, I organize things just slightly differently. Um, you can see that I've got a video footage bin, and inside that video footage bin, uh, I've got the uh, an interview with the chef and a and footage of the baklava production. Basically, all the organization is, of bins is just to help you find your footage. Um, if it takes you more than just a few seconds to find the shot that you're looking for, you're going to be wasting a lot of time while you're editing. So this is just a good basic start to, to organize that footage. As this grows, I'll start adding bins for you know, photos in here. Uh, as I get closer to finalizing a project, there'll be graphics, um, you know, maybe some uh, like a music track, uh, something like that. So let's put these all at the same level. Yeah, so you'll start to get bits and pieces. But you want all this stuff separated so it's easy to find depending on, on what level of the, the post-production workflow you're working in. One thing that I'd like to emphasize real quick is it's really important to save your project. Inevitably, the more you edit, you're going to have your software crash. doesn't matter what you're using. At some point or another, while well, something is rendering or you're trying to do too much at once, your computer's probably going to get overload, overwhelmed and something's going to crash. Keeping that in mind, you want to do two things. You want to be backing up everything that you have. So, like I said before, I organize my footage at the end of every shoot day. Once I've organized it, I also go and I back everything up on an external drive, at least one external drive, sometimes two. Um, and then I also make sure that as I'm working in my software that I'm saving every couple of minutes. Every time I take a major edit or any time I reorganize everything, I hit Command Save, which is pretty much the same on, on every, uh, whether you're Windows or Mac, there's a good shortcut just to, to quickly save your project and just like that you're protected. There are auto save features to save every few minutes but I just instinctually hit that quick save uh, shortcut every time I do something significant. So once we've organized all our footage and we set up our project the next thing we need to do is to start reviewing our footage and figuring out what we have and what's the best stuff and, and how this might eventually come together. So what I like to do is we have this uh, sync sequence here um, that basically syncs up all the audio, um, the footage, and the, uh, the actual good interview audio. Um, I tend to duplicate this file. So that original 
synced sequence is still intact in case I uh, screw something up. And then I call this sync trim down. And this is basically where I just start picking out the good stuff. And there's instances like here where I know I'm not going to use this. There's no footage, it's just leftover audio. Um, and I can use the um, trim button to cut this audio up. And I can use the uh, the selection key, which is uh, V on a Mac, to get rid of that. I can you know, just trim this down a little bit. It's you know, mostly interviews, so I don't have to get rid of too much stuff. This audio in the end isn't doing anything. That's about it. So the next step is to start actually reviewing the interview footage. Usually what I like to do is I like to find the audio track that is my ideal recording. Um, this is not it. That is an empty channel. Um, this one here has all the, the actual um, the best audio file. So here, this guy is speaking in Turkish. Um, but we can start the uh, bite here. If I hit shift, it'll slice everything and uh, go through you. And that looks like it's the end of his sound bite. Now, when you're working in another language, which a lot of people on the uh, reporting change course are, um, you're going to be doing this in concert with the script. So you'll be reviewing a script that has time code. Um, and then you're gonna basically compare that with with what you have on here. So here's one that has some loose time code on it um, that basically tells what what this um, what this man is talking about at each step of the way. So basically, I would go through the script, you know, maybe pick out the sound bites that I like the most, you know, change the color of the text to identify the ones that I really like, and then start hunting for those in this timeline. Now, if, if you know what, if you speak the same language as the interview, um, then you can just kind of listen through and start picking out the, the parts that you really like. Now, once I've done that, though, what I'll do is I'll pull those sound bites that I really like just up a level, just to distinguish them from from other parts on the timeline. Now, I'll take a similar approach with just the pure B-roll or non-interview sound. I'll start going through my shots seeing what shots I, I really like the look of seeing if there's good natural sound like this like the sound of him scraping uh, into the oven there basically what elements might I want to use in the edit later you know, where, do, where do I get really good sound where do I get really good shots lined up um, start really selecting those um, so let's see if we scroll here. Let's say I like this shot here. I'll uh, you know, use my blade tool. And say I want to end it there after uh, after he drops it down. So I just might pull this up just to say, hey, I've got this nice shot that I like, um, and I want to use that later. Basically, go through all this start just identifying where are the really good shots I like, familiarizing myself with all the footage, so that once I start trying to build this story out, I know what my strong sequences are, I know what my strong shots are, and I know where my strong audio breaks are. So I'll have an idea of my in my head of what different sections I can pull those into. Once I have my script in place, I go back into the editing application and I go to my trim down file where all of those uh, sound bites that have been set aside for my script um, are already pulled up. I'll just grab the bites I need and take them into a new sequence and just drop them in there. And I'll just keep doing this until I have all of the clips that are from this script in a nice order. You can see here this is what it looks like uh, this is what it looks like when it's done. I basically just have all of these uh, clips in a row and what I tend to do is I copy and paste directly from the script into some text files so that I have some really roughed in uh, subtitles just so I know what footage I'm looking at as I move things around and rearrange things. Now this timeline that we put together from the script is really really simple. It's just the sound bites all butted up against each other 
there's it's going to be pretty boring. So what we want to do is we want to kind of break up all this interview audio with natural sound, uh, with some good sequences in between, so that make the piece flow a little bit more. So as you can see in this timeline here, I started just dropping in places where there's some natural, good natural sound breaks. You'll see in a lot of places here that they aren't exactly on the edit. There's uh, there's a little bit of overlap. So the sound starts to come in while he's talking. Then there's some louder sound. The the sound bites you know really stand out, and then it you know starts to fade off while he starts speaking again. So you really want to layer this. It's not cut natural sound cut. You know it's the natural sound and the uh, and the sound bites really kind of flow into each other. And at the end of the day, once you've got this audio all together, it should sound like a radio piece when you close your eyes. You know, if you just ignore the video and kind of listen to the sound, um, it, it should be like a really well done radio piece where the sounds are creating a sense of the scene that you're in and the sound bites all really make sense and are, are nice and tight. Um, that's really what you want to aim for at this step. Once you have a good sense of your your natural sound breaks and those are worked in, well, then it's really about you know f kind of finishing up the piece, finishing up your rough cut. You've still got a lot of blank spaces where it's just you know talking head footage, or probably a lot of other blanks that aren't quite dialed in. So what what you want to do is just keep working through all the uh, the shots that you really like, the shots that make sense, and start bringing them into an edit. So you can see here now I've got a bit of a rough cut. Uh, with the uh, the audio all layered in here, a lot more footage is worked in. You know, I'm, I'm creating, I'm using my sequences to create full scenes. There's a nice variety of close-ups and wide shots that really like create a sense of of space. Now, once I have all of this together, you know, this is basically like your first rough draft. And from here, this is when I start to show other people. First of all, I'll send it back to my translator and say, hey, are these uh, subtitles that I have lined up right? Do the qu quotes make sense? Um, did I match everything up right? I'll start asking other people, is my my story structure dialed in well? Should I you know, move, move this around a little bit? This is the, the time when I want feedback because this is basically the stories in place all this, the sound elements are in place and there's enough video worked in here that it's actually starting to feel like a story. And then from there, feedback after feedback, I'll keep refining this. I'll keep dialing it and keep tightening it up over and over again. After I do a cut, I'll then just duplicate my rough cut. So you can see up here in the window, I've got rough cut, um, the original rough cut, and then I've got rough cut two. And every time I do another round of editing, I'll just duplicate it. Because who knows, maybe I'll try something new, I'll move a bunch of stuff around, and I ended up not liking it, and I want to go back. Well, then I can always just go back to the last version I had, and it's all, it's still in there. So it's a good way to just do iterations of your edit. Now, once you've done enough versions of your edit where you're, you're happy with it, where you feel like you've reached your final cut, where this is, this is the story that you want to publish. And the very first thing that I like to do once I, I know that this is going to be you know my edit is really dial in the audio. Um, and there's a, there's a few things you, that you want to do. The, basically, the, the way I like to start is there's a different workspace you can select. You can go into um, audio, and basically it just gives you a really big audio media, meter here. And then I'll just start you know giving it a listen and seeing where the levels go. You really want all of your primary audio, so the, the, the sound bites, um, people talking, anything like that, to be somewhere between you know, negative six to negative 12 uh, decibels. Um, maybe up to negative three in some places, but once you start going over, over that, you're just flirting with the with possibly overmodulating or the audio not being that crisp. Every application has a few ways to do this. A lot of times there's, as you can see here, just a bar that you can take up and down. Um, the other option, if I right click um, here, you can do audio gain. You can kind of force all the peaks to normalize to a certain level. So that'll take um, all the peaks in that audio clip, push them up so that they're, they're close to zero decibels, so almost hitting the ceiling, or you can force them to normalize to a lower level. I like to just keep playing around with these until I, I hit an area where it's around, you know, in the negative six to negative twelve range. Now, be careful. If you recorded really, really low audio, um, there's not going to be a lot you can do to fit to to save it. You can push audio up and down a little bit, but. 
pushing it too far in one direction or the other, you're going to start to get a lot of hiss and distortion in there. The other thing that, that I like to do is once I feel like the levels are all right, so the speaking audio is all, you know, hitting in that negative 16, negative 12 range, um, is then I really like to, to finesse the transitions. And there's a couple of just really simple transitions to use. Audio transition crossfade, constant power. If you are transitioning from, say, a sound bite into, you know, some kind of noise um, or some kind of natural sound, you can drop this in between any cl clip. And I also find that um, if you're cutting between clips, so for instance, if we had like a little bit of a popping sound or not a smooth transition between these two sound bites, we could put a little uh, crossfade here. And if you click it, you can set exactly how much time. I find that by default, they're a little too generous. So I sometimes try to just take it down to, you know, eight seconds, something that just really, it's really just there to kind of smooth it out. So it's not such a hard cut. Um, you don't have to do that for everything. It's really only if you, you hear something noticeable. Um, and you, you don't have to do these crossfades just with that. The Actually, my favorite way to do it, and I think where you get the most control, is to use this pen tool over here, or you can just use the shortcut P. And what you do is you can just go anywhere in these timelines uh, and just start making dots and uh, start dragging them all over the place and you can do all sorts of different things here and these are really great for the natural sound breaks so if you've got you know some good natural sound you can hit a bunch of these points here um, you can bring up certain parts so that you get a little bit more of natural sound someplace and then you can finesse how that fades out um, as the primary audio comes in but using that pen tool you can really go through your whole piece and make sure that the audio is really smooth, you never have any hard cuts coming through, um, that one thing just really you know, leads into the other and it's going to help smooth out your entire piece. So once you have your audio really finalized and have finished your audio mix, the next thing to do is clean up your video. Um, there's sometimes going to be instances where shots don't match or exposure can be uh, tweaked a little bit. You may have noticed going through this that the interview footage that we have is a little warmer than a lot of the other footage so if you compare it to you know this shot where they're working the baklava um, in in the factory white looks like white but if you compare it there's uh, you know everything in this frame just looks a little bit warm so that's something that I would want to balance out there's a few ways to do that you click on here and you can add this three-way color corrector which is in the effects um, video effects color correction and for this it's really as simple as you can grab the the highlight thing and try and find something that's white in the frame here we don't have a lot of options but we could tell it that that looks white um, we could say this is black um, and the midtones you want to just find something that's nice and gray um, let's say that that's gray and so you can see that already things have kind of um, Gotten a little bit less warm. Um, so there, like playing with the midtones there, that already is looking a little less orange than we were before. And when you compare that to the following shot, it's far less distracting um, than it was a second ago. And the other thing that's really easy is once you select um, that effect you can use command copy go over to another similar shot and command v paste it and if it's if it's going to be the exact same thing you can just keep applying that to all your similar shots to ease that up there's a couple other ones that, that are worth using here so let's go back to this first one get rid of the three-way color corrector my favorite one to use actually if and if you have any experience with Photoshop this is gonna make a lot of sense to you but I like to use just plain old curves because in here I can really control everything I can uh, I know I need to take a little bit of the red out now we got too much green in there you know you can start just playing around with this really get it to where it needs to be and I find that there's one thing that really helps me uh, dial this in is if you go up to um, window and bring up the reference monitor you can use this to uh, kind of view 
um, the different Mars. And my favorite one for this is uh, RGB Parade. So this will kind of basically tell you where your uh, what colors are a little too much, and you can kind of keep playing with this to really dial it in, figure out you know, what's too hot, what's too low, um, and you can kind of just move all your points around until you get it to the uh, to where you want to be. Now, for quick work, that's pretty close. So we turn that off. You can see how orange it was, and now that it's a little bit blue, you can see that you know it's cooled off a little bit here. The uh, on the monitor, the red is kind of dialed back a little bit. The blue has come up. The green is about the same. So you can tell we've kind of leveled this off a little bit as far as you know getting to a color temperature and exposure that we can be happy with. And so as I'm as I'm finalizing this, I'm basically working my way you know, shot by shot through the entire piece, lining them up next to each other. You can actually see them physically, you know, next to each other. Now the very last step for your polishing, once your audio is completely dialed in, all of your, your shots are, are color graded, the last thing to do is add in any graphics. So I would go through and I would start tweaking all of these uh, subtitle files, making sure they're really perfect and timed well. Depending on the client you're working with, you might have a tail slate or a head slate. Um, you'll have different lower thirds graphics that identify the, the people. Um, if you have any other kind of text usage, you'll want to be using their fonts. Um, and there's a lot of different ways depending on what software you're using to do that. Um, in Premiere, you just do a new item um, title and you can do a lot of variety of things to create um, new title graphics pretty much limited just to just different kind of text options in this view. You can put a lot of different shapes and some other things, but if you're actually trying to draw anything complex, this is, might not be the best place to do it. But if you're just doing simple text like subtitles or some lower thirds, you can you can make do in here. Um, the other way, and this is really common if you're working with a client who does a lot of videos, they'll send you a Photoshop file or something like that. And at that point, you just import um, that Photoshop file um, so you can see that here in my graphics, I've got a, you know, a couple ones for World Press Photo. Um, just hit that, and it'll bring it in. And you can just pretty much drop that anywhere in the timeline. You'll have to size it, of course, depending on on the project. Um, but yeah, just importing those files. You can edit the actual PSD files um, separately and they will update um, in Premiere. And that's pretty much standard for you know Final Cut X and I believe Avid. Um, so you just kind of do the, the serious graphic work outside of your editing software and just import them and place them. And once all of your graphics are in place, then you're basically done. Then it's time to send your file. Go down to export, export media, and there's going to be a lot of what are probably going to be overwhelming options for you. The best thing to do in this scenario is figure out where your video is going and do an output that makes sense for that. If you're doing it for a client, they should specifically tell you um, what what they want. Is it going to be full HD? Do they want a lower compression? If, they're, if you're sending from a place that has low bandwidth, you're going to probably want to compromise some quality for a lower file size. Um, if you're sending it to Vimeo or YouTube, those both those places have guidelines for what is the optimal upload. It's best to just follow those uh, compression recipes straight from the site. And yeah, and you, then you just work through this, fill out all the different things depending on, on where you're sending it, hit export, and you'll have your final file. Now, that'll be good for the client or for where you're uploading it, but I also highly recommend that you, you know, basically output, you know, what right here is considered an uncompressed version, just the, the highest uh, resolution version that you can um, of this for your own safekeeping and back that up in a couple of places. Uh, and then personally, because I think storage is cheap enough this, these days that it's worth it, I just take all the assets for the project, um, everything that's in my... Um, project folder right here all of this stuff 
I just keep it all together and I back it up in, on an archive drive and then I back it up on my archives backup drive as well. So basically two places, the place, the archive that I'm constantly accessing and then some kind of offsite storage. So that if either of those goes down, I still have my, my backup. Cause you never know, you never know when you might be able to license or sell footage or use it in a future project. Um, and the cost of, of storage nowadays is, is pretty much low enough that it's worth just backing up everything um, and, and, and saving it for the long run, project by project. Be sure to check back in on Facebook and Twitter when the Reporting Change Multimedia Workshop kicks off on April 5th here in Istanbul. We'll have more tips and tricks for you then. I hope to see you soon.